you know, it even kind of seems to me that this is a more of kind of um, the monitoring and maintaining part of our job in IT. And a lot of people would rather build things than they would monitor and maintain. So something that often seems like it gets pushed to the, the side. And certainly with budgetary constraints, you know, I think we're all feeling this wherever we are in the world. Uh, you know, IT budgets are not what they once were. And the first thing it seems to go in most shops from the people I talk to are performance monitoring things. It's one of those things that isn't crucial, right? We don't have a problem right now. We haven't had a problem for six months. Why do we need to renew the license on this? You know, if we have a problem with this, we'll come back to it. We'll do something else. But it's kind of an easy point to take off a budget. Um, so baselining is the other thing I'm going to talk about. And that's something I think most of us know we should be doing, but very few people do. Um, it's one of those things that's always on your list, right? It's about number 14 to do, and you get to about nine things in a given week. And I completely understand that. So again, part of the idea of what I'm going to do here today is hopefully give you some free, easy ways to do this um, so that you can go back to work next week and actually accomplish something without spending any real time doing it. And at the end of the week, show your boss, hey, look what I did. I got great ROI. You need to send me to another conference like really quick, right? OK, so what this session is not, um, essentially, it's not an in-depth discussion of performance and performance-related counters. I am going to talk about that, but I'm not going to sit here for 45 or 50 minutes and dig into you know, the thousands of performance counters that are available on Windows. And by the way, if you'd like that, put it down on your feedback form. I mean, I could do that next year. I just thought everybody would probably walk out of the room on me. Uh, but if that's actually something that interests you, uh, that's certainly something maybe we could look into doing next year. Uh, I'm not going to do a recommendation of various server configuration options or tweaking. If you're looking for SMB tuning options or things like that, that's not something I'm really going to talk about. I think there's a lot of that stuff out there. Um, uh, there's a lot of fairly good stuff from vendors, from Citrix, especially if you've got a Citrix infrastructure. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit more of a higher level thing, um, trying to identify where your issues are so that you may know I need to go tweak this or look at this, um, rather than actually get into the mechanics of those tweaks. So what this session is, essentially, is an introduction to some free and easy to use tools. And I'm going to talk about two of them mostly. And I'm going to spend most of my time on one, which I think is far superior to almost anything that's out there, um, certainly at a free level, and superior, I think, to a lot of actually paid products. Um, any of you consultants? We've got a few of you. OK, so one of the dirty little secrets is, is you can take some of these free tools, right, do a consulting job with them, and then bill people, because it happens. I've seen these reports come through a lot. Uh, to customers, and they say, hey, we paid $1,000 for the server analysis. And I'm looking at that going, OK. <laughs> you might want to have a talk to your consultant about what he's billing you for software. But anyway, um, I'm also going to try and induce you to do some quick and easy baselining that you might have been uh, neglecting. Um, you know, the, the key to all this stuff is making it easy and quick, right? So as much as you can kind of set this stuff up and walk away from it and do something else and come back, I think the more likely it is to get used in your organization. Uh, I'm going to assume you have a working familiarity with the built-in Windows performance monitor. Um, if not, that's something I don't know that will make a whole lot of sense here. But I think it, it's still understandable. Um, and if you don't have a familiarity with that, you've got a long way to go, uh, even with these tools. So why use these tools? Well, speed's one of them, uh, particularly when you're troubleshooting, right? All hell breaks loose. People want things fixed immediately. So if you're going to take perfmon logs or something else by hand, I don't care how fast you type, it takes a certain amount of time to get up and functional, right? You have to create the proper counters. You've got to remember the right ones. You've got to remember which of the 82,000 disk counters is really relevant to what you're doing. You've got to remember how many disks or partitions you've got. Are you going to monitor logical disks, physical disks? What kind of memory we're going to do? All of this stuff. You can end up bogged down in trying to get the actual counters built while the house is on fire around you. So the quicker you can deploy something to monitor and gather the data, the better, I think. Um, depth is another one. Um, performance monitoring, there's a lot of areas, right? You can break it down into three or four major areas, but there's a lot of subcomponents, and it's easy to miss something. Or even worse, sometimes it's easy to monitor a few things, see an indication of trouble, but because you aren't monitoring other things, you don't realize they're related. Uh, so you can end up going down the wrong path, spending a lot of money to fix a problem that isn't really a problem, but a symptom of another problem. So again, the faster you can get up something of depth and complexity to give you an overview, uh, the better. Consistency is another one. If you're going to do this over time, it doesn't really help if you're trying to compare apples to oranges, right? You need some of the same metrics taken from you know, perhaps roughly the same time of day, uh, you know, measuring the same sorts of things. You don't want a hodgepodge of counters you know, of what a, you know, a seemed to you to be right that particular day. 
so why baseline? And, and that's pretty much the same issue, right? Um, you can't know where you're going unless you know where you've been. If you don't have a frame of reference, when you go to analyze a system and look at it, you don't have any place to start. Something may seem to be high. Something may seem to be out of whack. But if you don't have a baseline and you don't know what it looks like when everything's OK, you're making guesses. They might be educated guesses, but they're still guesses nonetheless. And so unless you have some sort of core, um, you really don't know where you're going. And I think you can end up wasting a lot of time. Uh, it certainly makes troubleshooting easier. I mean, if you have a baseline, if you know what things should look like when everything's going well, um, then when you find something out of whack, it should stick out at you like a sore thumb. And it should be much easier to identify and then hopefully take steps to alleviate. The big part to me in a lot of ways is making projections possible. Um, I come from a large corporate environment. My uh, infrastructure is in a corporate data center that's several hundred miles away. I've been doing this job seven or eight years. I've never actually physically seen my hardware. It's somewhere far removed. Some guys take care of it in a data center. And because that's a large organization with a big bureaucracy, there's a lot of lead time involved, right? I can't just call these guys up and tell them, hey, rack me up a server. I need you know, 50 more servers by next Tuesday. They have projections. They've got data center concerns, you know, power, cooling, you know, electricity, all that kind of stuff that makes data center people a pain in the ass to deal with. Um, so the earlier I can get my projections out there and the more accurately I can get them, the better I find myself in. And you know, remember the business I'm in. I have to perform essentially on my calendar in the US, January to April. If I have problems during that time frame, I'm in trouble. I can get by with some problems early, but I got to get them fixed uh, later in the season. And we've got to be ready for that. Um, so that means I'm making my projections in terms of hardware and capacity four, six months ahead of time at least, because I need that stuff bought. I need it racked. I need the data center guys to do their stuff. I need the other guys to lay down their stuff. And you know the 14 other teams that are involved whenever you deploy something in a data center to get their stuff out of the way before I can get busy with my stuff. And then, of course, I want that stuff up and running for a while. I want to make sure I don't have any problems. I don't have anything that's dead out of the box or fails in the first 30 days. So the quicker I can make projections and start drawing up budgets, and I haven't even addressed the whole idea of fighting for that budget, right? You know, you come back and say, I need, you know, 27 new servers this year, and they say, well, you can have 12. Well, you know, here are my projections, here are my baselines. If you give me 12, this is what's going to happen. And you know what, when these guys come calling in February, and they don't want to renew, and they don't want to give us any more money, it's right here on paper. I told you, right? So, you know, and hopefully that works both ways, right? I don't overestimate, so they don't come back to me the next year and say, you know, you ordered 42 servers. It looks like you needed eight. You're not going to get any for the next two years because we're mad that you blew our CapEx budget. That did happen one year. <laughs> Only one. <laughs> Uh, so the first thing I'm going to talk a little bit about is Performance Wizard, um, otherwise known as PerfWiz. And this is old. Uh, this dates back to about 2004 or so. And essentially, it uses existing performance monitor calendars. And it's a way of quickly configuring a performance monitor uh, log file. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this, even though it's this old, is you kind of see a couple of things in your infrastructure, right? Um, you get old systems which people stop paying attention to, right? You have something that sits in the corner and it just runs and it runs. And it might actually be really, really important, but it runs. You know, maybe it's one of those god awful things that won't run on Windows 2008. So you've got some Windows 2003 servers stuck in a corner that it runs on. And you don't know if you're ever going to migrate off of it. You know, God help you if it's something that requires like IE6 to run or something like that, right? So everybody has some of this stuff kicking around in their infrastructure. Or they have a client that has some of this kicking around. Um, and that stuff tends to get mostly ignored. Um, so I wanted to give you the option for some tools that work just fine on older hardware and older operating systems, uh, because there were some significant changes in the way the uh, performance monitor worked uh, between 2003 and 2008. The whole log file system changed. The format of the BLG file, the native perfmon counter file changed. Um, so you get some issues depending on the tools that you're trying to use uh, you know, and in the environment you're trying to use them in. So the nice thing about Performance Wizard is there's virtually no install footprint. And I'll show you this in a minute. But if you're in any sort of controlled environment where people don't want you installing anything, this is really nice. You can set this monitoring up and essentially not touch anything or install anything. Um, so it creates an easily customizable performance mod log, log file that can be reused. So you can reuse this on different servers. Um, what it will not do very well is scale. You can't set this up to monitor 100 servers or something like that. I shouldn't say you can't. You could, but your pain tolerance better be pretty high. 
uh, whatever you're going to get out of it is going to be a, a spaghetti mess of graph lines and everything else. And if you've got nothing better, it can be done, but you're going to be investing a lot of work on it, I think, for maybe somewhat questionable value. And I'll say that really across the board. I think that's what separates a lot of the free tools um, from the ones that you're going to have to pay some money for is how they scale. You know, can you monitor a few servers? Sure. Uh, you know, can you monitor a few hundred? Well, if they're all the same, if you're using something like a provisioning server or an imaging thing, you know, some sort of imaging software, and so you've got consistency, sure, you know, that might work. But it's certainly not going to work on a heterogeneous environment where you've got lots of different machines. Um, and as a best practice, you always want to try and remotely monitor. And what that means is essentially you're running Perfmon from a machine somewhere that's a non-production machine, an administrative machine, some sort of thing you got off the side. You're connecting to that machine you want to monitor and grabbing the performance data from it, but you want to avoid the hit that comes to that machine of storing the performance monitor data locally. There's a certain overhead involved. There's some disk writes. There's some other things. So whenever possible, you want to try and remotely monitor. And PerfWiz makes that really, really easy. Um, again, this is an older tool, and it's mostly useful in a 32-bit world. Um, but it is something I wanted to point out to you as an option. So let's go ahead and take a look at it here. It comes as a simple zip file download from Microsoft. And you get it. You get a EULA doc, right? Everybody ignores those, right? So when you run PerfWiz, it's simple enough. You get a nice wizard. You click Next. What's my monitoring computer? Again, this is what you want to be your non-production machine. This is where that data is going to be gathered and where those BLG log files are going to be written. What do I want to do? Do I want to create a new log? In this case, you can see one I have. I already created a log here, and that's available and stopped for me. But if I want to create a new log, it's just next. There's a standard Perfmon, which is just a standard collection of performance counters that Microsoft thought would be useful. There's one specifically targeted if you have a high CPU condition. And then there's this advanced configuration one. So here's your target computer. That would be the thing that you want to monitor. Um, it's nice in the sense that you have options for terminal server and an exchange server. Again, from an exchange server standpoint, this was like an exchange 2003 you know, era type of thing. There is an updated exchange 2007 file that was done by one of the exchange MVPs that you can use with this. But frankly, if you're on 07 or later exchange, there's different tools to use that I think are probably better, off, better for you. So you get to name a log file. You can specify size, which you really want to do. Uh, it's possible that maybe somebody I knew once didn't set a size and left a Perfmon counter running for a week and ate up all the hard drive space on one of his administrative machines. Certainly was not me. Was not me, but maybe somebody I knew. Maybe. <laughs> all right, so let's just give that a different name. Um, your average time to issue, um, what this is essentially asking you is how long before you think you're going to have a problem if you're monitoring. If that's right now, then obviously that's not terribly relevant. Your sample interval is interesting. You want to be a little careful here because there is a certain amount of overhead to this. And all of these tools gather everything, including the kitchen sink. It's not like they're doing a half dozen Perfmon counters. So you might want to think about that interval. Generally speaking, what the average time to issue um, is going to do in terms of the sample interval is give it some idea of how often to look. If you're not expecting the issue to occur because you had to reboot or whatever that might be for hours, it's not going to gather information every single second for you. Um, it's going to wait. So these are the options that you get in terms of, uh, of what particular things you want to monitor. And these are the parent objects. These are not individual counters, like if you look at the process object or something like that. When you select that, and again, this is what I talk about, you know, you're gathering everything but the kitchen sink. If you're on a multi-user system like a terminal server or a Citrix box, you've got a lot of processes, right? So you're going to get a fairly large uh, you know, log file. And then again, that's something to think back in relationship to how often you're going to sample. You probably don't want to be sampling those things every second unless you really have a crucial issue that you need to, to delve into. So you can make your own customizations here in terms of what you want uh, and choose these options or not choose them. And then it's a start-stop thing. It's about as simple as it gets. You can even use this to stop the log file and delete if you know, right-click is something that's you know, a little challenging that day. Um, so it's about as simple as it gets, right? Um, but you can see with that wizard, you can put together something and be monitoring something in a matter of what, 10 seconds, 15 seconds probably at the most. And you can have a fairly consistent monitoring solution there, right? If you run this at different times, you just mark the same boxes, you'll be monitoring the same things. Again, you, even from a baselining standpoint, you set this up, you run it, you tell it to monitor maybe every 60 seconds or a couple of minutes depending on your needs, let it run for a day, 
tuck it away, right? Every, when, every second Wednesday of the month or something like that, you can do something like this. It doesn't require a lot of your attention or time. You just archive it off, and as time allows, you take a look at it. Or even if you don't really have time to take a look at it when you gather it, if you're involved in some heavy-duty troubleshooting, you should be able to open up one from when you were refined and when, one from when you aren't, and certainly make a lot of headway under what's going on. Any questions at this point? Ah, you're being so European. So that's perfwis. And again, generally speaking, um, I, I don't know that I would use this unless you have certain legacy kind of, um, of uh, you know, things that you're looking at. There's better tools. And the next tool I'm going to talk about, I, I think, is a much better tool um, for doing some performance analysis. But again, this works, right? You know, if you're doing remote monitoring, all you're doing here is creating you know, um, a set of Perfon counters that you point at a, at a remote machine. All you need is access to that machine. As long as you have a user account to run it under, which is customizable, you can pull that performance data off a production box. You've got nothing installed on it locally. You don't have to worry if you're in a controlled environment or you've got a change control process that, you know, people want you to go through before you, uh, you know, do anything like that. So it's simple and easy, and it's a relatively zero footprint. So. Perf was it uses your existing performance monitor counters. There's virtually no install footprint. It's easily customizable. And we already did this, so we'll try and get past through this. So again, as you saw there in the wizard, it's easy to remotely monitor. You can point it at whatever box you want. The problem again with that, of course, is, is that you're only really pointing it at one box. Now at the end of the game, what this produces for you is an HTM file that can be sucked into performance monitor and run. So if you want to go in and edit that and add other server names, you can do it. But again, the results you're going to get out are going to be pretty ugly. Uh, you know, pretty soon you've got a lot more lines on a graph than you, know, you ever really wanted to look at. I think it's nice that you've got these targeted options for terminal servers in Exchange. And one of the reasons why I'm talking about Exchange a little bit is, is probably like most of you, I have environments that aren't isolated, right? I have about 50 published applications. Most of those increasingly have some other sort of back end somewhere that's not really necessarily directly under my control. It may be a SQL back end, it may be SharePoint. You know, I'm making Outlook available, so I've got to worry about Exchange. And you know, what happens whenever there's a performance problem, right? It's the terminal server guys. You know, you call up the Exchange guys, hey, is everything fine? Of course it is. What's wrong with your boxes? I don't think I've ever heard an Exchange admin ever admit that there was a problem. SQL admins will admit it, but only six months later after they told you they fixed it. Uh, so, you know, there are some options there. And, you know, one of the funny things is you get into weird organizational politics. And when you have these sorts of things that run apps that really belong to you, but you don't technically have access to them, the SQL guys and the Exchange guys don't like them, right? Because they don't fully own them. They're, they're customer facing. They do something like that. So they view them as, you know, the redheaded stepchild or something of the family. And they would rather ignore them. You know, what we found in many cases is that they didn't have the same internal monitoring and things like that because they weren't really directly responsible, you know, um, to that team. When there was a problem there, nobody came to that team and said, hey, why aren't you guys fixing that? When there's a problem, they came to us. You know, so. And, you know, your other options there, of course, is it supports a customization. If you find that you've got too much there and you want to narrowly target that down, particularly if you get further along down the road of baselining and you decide that there's, you know, maybe 12 or 18 counters you want to look at rather than dozens upon dozens. And again, don't forget that maximum log file size. You don't want to be like that guy I know. Um, and it is GUI based, and yes, that is a good thing, um, or at least in some cases, right? Uh, because sometimes when you need to get up and functional on something in a hurry, you don't want to be sitting there looking at the help figuring out what the command switches are. Uh, you know, I like to say things always go wrong in our environment either on Friday night or on Sunday, right? And typically when I'm on call and I'm tired and probably after I'm asleep. So in my younger days, I might have been able to hop out of bed and fire off things and you know, get two dozen performance counters up and running inside a couple of minutes. At this stage in my life, the coffee machine has to go on first before I'm getting anywhere. So a nice GUI wizard driven thing, that, that's kind of like where my brain is when a lot of things tend to break. Um, I, maybe that's a, an observation more on my karma or <laughs> or my individual organization than it is in IT in general. But there's something to be said for this, right? If you're not a dedicated performance person, um, some nice next, next wizards are not the worst thing in the world. So we already took a look. I'm a little out of order on my slides. I apologize. So the thing I really am interested in talking about is the performance analysis of logs tool or PAL. Anybody ever heard of PAL or used it? 
Not a hand, really? That's pretty cool. So, you know, Microsoft has this open source site called CodePlex, CodePlex.com. So if you go to CodePlex.com slash PAL, you'll see this project. And Clint Huffman is the guy behind it who I believe was some sort of escalation engineer or worked with Microsoft Consulting. So he's basically one of God's own performance geeks. He really, really likes this stuff. And this project has been underway and been an actively maintained and developed project for at least a good five years now at this point. So it seems to have a, a fairly decent lifespan and a fairly uh, you know, active user community. So what need does it address, at least according to, uh, to Clint? So the big problem he viewed this as is manual data analysis. So I've used something like PerfWiz or something like this, and now I've got this pile of data, and, and what does it mean, right? You know, particularly if I'm under some pressure and I need, you know, somebody's pushing me for answers. I got lines, they go up and down, and you know, what, what does this mean? You know, this number says 150. Is 150 good or is it bad? Oh, well, great, I can Google this. And you know, three hours later, I'll have an answer from my boss who's probably already looking for new resumes, right? So one of the fundamental ideas here was to get some sort of automated analysis. It's so one thing to, to automate the collection of the data. How about automating the analysis of the data, right? That, that, that's the real value. So one of the other problems, as he put it, was the knowledge of Windows internals. And you know, in our business, uh, I think we probably have a little bit more knowledge of some kernel uh, stuff just because of the way we've come through the years with kernel space issues and terminal servers and virtualization. But your average Windows admin, I don't think really runs into this, at least not too much in my experience. And if you don't believe me, sometimes uh, go Google the uh, two gig virtual address space and just see all the hits for people arguing back and forth what that is and then add in something like physical address extension, PAE or AWT, all those nice games that we were playing back when our infrastructure was all 32 based. The level of confusion about this stuff is just absolutely ridiculous. Um, and even people who've been supposedly working and know these issues still get confused about it on a semi-regular basis it seems. So it might be a little much to expect that your average Windows admin um, has some knowledge of this. And certainly in our business, right, we might be focused on something else. You know, maybe we're the app V guy or maybe we're the virtualization guy or something. And you know, this just isn't something that we've ever had the time or inclination to pursue. So if you need to know something like what's my rate of, you know, deferred procedure uh, processor calls? I don't know what a DPC is. You know, now I've got to go try and figure that out. I've got to try and figure out who that source is. Is this guy legitimate? Who is this guy? Is this some sort of you know, industry standard number? Does this guy, you know, have any idea what he's talking about or is this specific to his environment? So part of the goals there was to provide some knowledge. And part of all of this is saving time, right? If you can save time gathering the data and you can save time analyzing the data, well then we're 90% of the way home, right? And it's that last 10% that's gonna kill you which is fixing it now that you know what you need to fix. So the other real goal of this is to consolidate the various recommendations and best practices. I'm sure I probably am not saying anything to surprise you when I say that Microsoft has occasionally published contradictory or misleading information on the same topic. Every once in a while it seems, and I'm sure they're you know, well-intended people, but one MVP's got a blog post saying this and a product manager is saying this and some marketing guy is saying this and you're sitting here going, screw you all, Who, who's your competitor? <laughs> well, who else can I buy from? And it's customizable, and that's the other nice thing about all of these tools is that if you get down this path and you find this stuff useful and valuable in your organization, you can customize it to your needs. You know, again, this is their open source site, um, so you can interact, the source code is available, you can you know, uh, essentially modify this to your heart's content. To give you some idea, the original, um, well I can't say the original, but I guess um, the feature complete 32-bit version of PAL when it came out was in VBScript, and it was about 6,000 lines of VBScript which I don't know about you, I never want to be involved with any VB script that even approaches 1,000 lines, much less 6,000 lines. So this guy has a passion for this. And of course, he wrote, he wrote everything in PowerShell because Microsoft has to rewrite everything in PowerShell now. Um, and that's not a bad thing, um, but it, it's, it's a pretty powerful piece of software now and he certainly invested a lot of time in it. And you know, the final piece of this is the pieces, what I call the pieces of the puzzle, which was what I was talking about earlier. Right? I've got this, this infrastructure, I've got SQL, I've got Exchange, I've got things all over the place, and I don't necessarily know what's relevant to what I'm doing. You know, to be brutally honest, I think I usually have a pretty good idea on what's going on on my Citrix and terminal servers. I mean, things escape me, but generally speaking, I mean, that's my job and that's what, you know, my feet get held to the fire over, right? So I know when things are starting to head bad in my farm. I got no idea when things are starting to head bad on the Exchange server. 
And depending on the metric that somebody else is looking at, they may not know it either. I mean, if you ask the exchange guys, maybe they're just checking CPU and they reply back, everything's fine. You know, that's not going to help you with things like RPC calls or, you know, something in the MTA counter or something, which I have absolutely no idea what it means, but apparently can be important to email servers. So the ability to capture this stuff is, is pretty uh, uh, interesting. And, and frankly, where the, the real value of this was shown to me is I had an issue at one point. I make Microsoft Office available to my customers, right? So I have 13,000 individual firms. I get about 30,000 concurrent users at peak. And these are these accounting and tax professionals. They live in Outlook almost as much as they live in their tax and accounting software because that's how they're communicating with their clients. It's how they're communicating with the guy who sits next to them. You know, they live in Outlook like you know, most of us do. So the ca calls start coming in. Outlook is really slow. I'm sitting here looking at my boxes. Everything's fine, right? Well, not fine, at least not bad looking. Um, so we were able to fire off PAL against several things in the infrastructure and we ended up discovering that we had an issue on an exchange server. That's something that probably would have taken us days to figure out otherwise and we were able to get somewhere in hours. Um, and then that just left the interesting task of talking to the exchange guys. So uh, one of the nice things about PAL is it can be used both to create and analyze perfmon log files. The nice part about that is, is you can take any perfmon file with whatever data you have and run it through PAL, and it'll look at what it knows and analyze it. So you're not tied into a particular template that comes from PAL. You can take anything you got. So whatever you got lying around at the moment, you can chuck it at PAL, let it run, while you then go and look at something else and maybe try and get a more complete picture or something like that. Um, so you can be up and functional with it immediately. And this becomes really nice when you look at an historical perspective and you're looking at baselining. You know, maybe you have some old perfmon counters lying around. Maybe somebody did some work, you know, at some point. You can run these through this and get some analysis of where you stand, you know, what were potential issues at the time, that sort of thing. Um, so you can almost perform some archaeology on your infrastructure and get an idea where your servers were. Beware processing data on the production hardware. This is what I talked about earlier in that you don't really want to have uh, your actual monitoring running on the production box. Um, the PAL analysis is really intensive. E even with the PowerShell optimizations and everything else, this thing can crank away. Uh, to give you some idea, I think I took a ZenApp server and monitored it for somewhere between four and five hours for every 30 seconds. And then I pulled that data to my local workstation and ran PAL against it. It took it over an hour to chew through all that data. Um, and it pretty much pegged a CPU core. It's multi-threaded now in its most recent 64-bit version, so it does run faster. But this is a non-trivial processing thing. You really don't want to process logs on a production box. Gather logs all day long redirect those log files to a machine somewhere, but don't do this on a box in production. Because if you didn't have a performance problem, you're about ready to have one. And there's nothing more embarrassing than having a performance problem because of your performance monitoring software. True story, so uh, when we moved off of our 32-bit Citrix infrastructure, we moved on to 64-bit, you know, we, we lose Resource Manager, which was the built-in Citrix tool for monitoring things. Which was kind of sad because, I mean, for all of resource managers' limitations, it was not a bad little thing to get an overview of your software. So eventually, after some arguing back and forth, you know, we got Edge Site up and running. Well, it, depending on what you're monitoring and depending on the size of it, Edge Site can really work over your hard drive as it writes to its local database. So we were running through one year, and the disk performance started to really, really go downhill. And what was our way to resolve this? We had to turn off our monitoring software because that bought us about another three weeks of uh, getting through the season without uh, having to upgrade disk. So yeah, you always have to be careful with your monitoring software and where it's doing things. And that's probably one of the, I have a lot of complaints about Edge Site, but one of the biggest is, is it writes a lot to that local file, Firebird database. Um, you can specify a date uh, range within the log file. Um, so if the log file covers six hours and you're interested in the 20 minutes that morning that somebody reported an issue, you can narrow that file down and just look at those 20 minutes and not have the overhead of processing the entire file. Uh, this is the other nice thing, is it ships with a variety of customizable templates, including Exchange, and that's multiple versions through 3, 7, 10. Um, SQL, IIS, Hyper-V, surprisingly enough, SharePoint, even Active Directory. Um, so again, if you're looking at these parts of your infrastructure and you really have, I have no idea off the cuff what I should monitor to check out the health of a domain controller. You know, yeah, if it's CPU pegged, that's bad. <laughs> If there's no available memory, that's bad. But what specific counters that are relevant to Active Directory, I couldn't tell you that. I mean, I'd have to go looking, right? I can jump right into PAL, and it will make some of those decisions for me. 
And more importantly, when it gathers that data, it'll tell me what the hell it means. Um, because that would be another afternoon on my part Googling trying to figure out. You can specify an analysis interval in PAL. And what that means is essentially, say you have taken a three hour log file. The way PAL works is it takes a hunk of data and it looks at things and it will also compute high and low values and averages. So if you want to specify an analysis interval, you can specify a high, you know, a high number so that you get fairly granular you know, approaches. Or you can give it a, lar a lower number and you can get kind of larger numbers. That gets really interesting when you combine it in with the date range thing, right? So if you happen to be monitoring something and somebody says, you know, hey, at 9 o'clock this morning we really had issues for 10 minutes or something like that. Okay, set your time range for those 10 minutes and then take 50 time slices out of that 10 minutes. You can get pretty granular in taking a look at what's going on. Or if you don't care and you're interested in speed, say just give me one time slice for that 10 minutes. I'm interested in my high lows, lows and averages. And you know, based upon that decision, I'll you know, go somewhere else. Maybe I'll be more granular. Maybe I'll tell them they're nuts. You know, they just had too much coffee in the morning. Everything was fine. Uh, it creates HTML-based reports. It can also do it to XML if that's you know, your flavor. Um, but this is really nice for presenting to management, right? You know, you've got graphs and colors and things that look like web pages. They, they like that stuff. That's easy to understand, right? By the way, it also makes you look great, right? You know, your boss asks you to do something like this. You look at this beautiful HTML report I generated in 20 minutes. Aren't I good? You know? Um, and so that's nice. And it's certainly easy to archive off and everything else. Um, it and this is the best part because it includes some intelligence in the analysis and it allows you to customize those thresholds. So if Microsoft says your server should only have 40,000 context switches a second and you don't think that's right, you can go in and adjust that threshold so you don't get a false positive or what you believe is a false positive. Um, and that's one, by the way, I still see all the time. I mean, it used to be the running joke. What was always the first question people had when they uh, got resource manager in Citrix was context switches went red because it was set to like, I think, I think the default was 10,000, and it had uh, no intelligence about the number of processors. So by the time you got to you know, dual socket quad cores or something like that, you could easily do 100,000 context switches without worrying too much. And yet you were sitting at red all the time uh, in Resource Manager. So depending on your hardware, depending on your experience, you can adjust these uh, you know, however you want. Uh, I was talking to Barry Flanagan from Citrix at Brightform Chicago a few years ago, and he actually told me that you know, in recent years, at least since the advent of quad cores, They've never really been able to document a context switch problem. It's never really been a scalability issue with them. Uh, the only thing it actually ever seems really relevant of is it can help you spot a misbehaving app. If context switches on a particular server starts climbing, you probably have something stuck in some sort of tight loop. Um, and the odds are relatively good that that's not killing your box, but at least you know you've got a stuck app you need to probably take care of. So it offers guidance and standards, including descriptions of events and links to more information. And this is the part I really like. So I get links to more information and more documentation. Because I have meetings, right, where I sit down there and I say, here's this, and I think this is a problem. And the guy across the table says, well, I don't think it's a problem. Why do you think it's a problem? OK. <laughs> so now I have to have some sort of backup or documentation for why I'm saying what I'm saying, right? And as we'll see when we go through one of these PAL reports, you've got some options here. Um, you've got some artillery to back up your, your suggestions. True story, I actually had a discussion with a guy. We sat down in a meeting and I said, look, the server's at 100% CPU. We need to do something about it. He said, well, I don't think there's a problem. So at 100% CPU, well, it, that doesn't mean there's a problem. It just means it's fully utilized. OK, um, let's try a different tack. <laughs> and you know, I, right, there's a place for that line of thinking. You know, if this is some sort of back-end thing that processes batch jobs or something like that, that you know, only have to be returned after 24 hours or something like that. But certainly nothing that, you know, is customer facing that users interact with. I think we're happy at 100%. I'm not happy at 70%, um, but certainly not 100. Uh, but when you get into those arguments, it's nice to have some backup on your side, right? So let's go ahead and take a look at PAL. Um, I'm going to show you just something briefly here. Um, I'm not fortunate enough to have a decent laptop with a 64-bit OS on it. So the current versions of PAL are 64-bit only. Um, they still look pretty much the same, and you can still get a 32-bit version, which is nice depending on your needs. So I'm just going to show you what it looks like here in a 64-bit world. So this is, again, PAL. It's wizard-based. Um, you get a welcome tag. 
Here's the address here at pal.coplex.com. Coplex.com slash pal also works. I'm sorry, you guys. I don't think that's probably visible to you guys past about the third row. I apologize about that, but this is pretty straightforward. Download it yourself, and I think you'll be able to see what I'm talking about with any issues. So I don't think you'll, uh, you'll lose too much here. So in PAL, you have a counter log. So this is the analysis screen. This is where you would point to an existing Perfmon counter log and select it. And there you've got your restrict to your date time range if you want to do that. Here's part of the genius, which is these threshold files. So it comes baked in with all these threshold files that are pre-built for these applications. And again, I apologize to you guys in the back, but we've got Dynamics AX, we've got BizTalk, we've got Exchange 23710, we've got Exchange CAS and Hub Roles, uh, we've got a fast search server, we've got Hyper-V, we've got OCS, we've got IIS at three different versions, we've got Project Server, we've got SharePoint, we've got Threat Management Gateway, we've got a lot of stuff. More importantly, um, if it doesn't match what you're doing, you have a plain system overview that you can do. I mean, how Philips and Teleview clinical information got in there, I don't know. Somebody must have paid for that one, right? But again, the genius of open source here, right? You can go write your own threshold file, release it out here if that so pleases you, and it'll get integrated right into the releases. So um, you, also, you can export this to a Perfmon template file. So I can take Citrix Zen app, export this out to a Perfmon temp file, and then at this point I've got an XML file that I can stuck into Windows 2008. And because this is backward compatible with earlier versions, it will export to the HTM file that is valid for Windows 2003. So that's the nice thing about being on the current version is it's backwards compatible, whereas a lot of these other tool, older tools won't work forward into 2008. You know, as long as you've got a workstation here that's 64-bit you can install this on, you can monitor essentially any part of your infrastructure, you know, regardless of the age or bitness of the OS or anything else like that. Uh, you can also edit these things. So here's the customized Citrix um, Zen app um, threshold file, which sadly, there's not as much in here as I wish there was. So if you have somebody's template file, you can come in here and you can say, that's dumb, I'm going to take this out. Like, I, I might somewhat question the value of the Citrix licensing server connection failures. Yes, that's a problem. Yes, you would want to know about that. You will probably hear about it other ways. And that's more along the lines of, my farm is really broken, not my farm is having a performance problem where I want to baseline you know, how many Citrix license server connection failures I have. Hopefully that's zero, right? Uh, but you can come in here and add all sorts of things. You can delete them out. You can make new stuff. You can do whatever you want. You can even <laughs> edit your charts, right? So if you don't like the way the particular um, charts um, display, you can come in here and mess around with this stuff. Um, I'm never going to do that, but hey, if that's your kind of, of thing. Uh, and then again, you can change the threshold file property. So if you decide that number is too low or too high, depending on your environment, um, you don't have to live with someone else's uh, options. Um, and, and again, you can take the basic system overview and set inheritance on this. So you can take this as a starting point and then add something else into it for whatever else you want to monitor. Uh, you've got questions that are built in, and even these are, are editable if you want or if you want to add your own. Your number of processors, if you're in a 32-bit world, if you're using that 3 gigabit switch, which Hopefully, if you're in the server-based world, you, you are not, unless you have really, really specialized <laughs> applications. Um, whether or not you've got a 64-bit OS, your total memory, what happens with RAID drives, uh, this gets interesting in terms of the disk analysis when you're looking at queue lengths. You want to know what kind of RAID geometry you have because that number is dependent upon the number of spindles inside your RAID. Your output options, um, again, you can set um, your um, time slice options. And, and this is interesting here. Um, you can uh, you choose the option to process all the counters in the counter log. So if you're using a particular threshold analysis file, maybe it only has 75% of the things it cares about that you happen to have gathered in that log file if you got it from somewhere else. You can tell it, hey, process everything because you're here, everything that you know about, or restrict it to just the stuff that is deemed important in the threshold file. This is one of these ways to really speed up the processing, right? Uh, you know, if, if you want to just go and narrow down your processing time to, you know, a handful of counters instead of dozens upon dozens. Your file output, yeah, you can choose a directory. You can choose an HTML report or an XML output, depending on what you want. You can queue up multiple log files to process. This is nice because, again, this takes time if you have any large amount of data. Uh, so you can collect stuff all day long if you're baselining and you're not in an emergency situation. Kick this off at night to process, go home, and you don't have this, uh, you know, process eating half your machine or something like that or one core in your box because it will take a fair amount of time uh, to process anything. And then on the execution tab, you've got options here to add to the queue and to execute it now. 
uh, you know, restart the wizard. Uh, nothing that isn't fairly obvious, I don't think, um, too uh, difficult to understand. But that's just what the 64-bit one looks like. The 32-bit one is really pretty similar as well. I can find where I stuck it. By the way, if you care, depending on the OS you're installing on, PAL does have some requirements. It, it needs a log parser, which makes sense, right? It's parsing a log file. Um, oddly enough, it needs the Office 2003 web components. So even if you have Office 2007 installed, it needs those web components to generate its fancy reports somehow. There's some .NET framework requirements and things like that. If you're on a 64-bit Windows 7, even a Vista release, I don't think you'll, you'll probably own those already. Um, you most likely own them already you know, on your older OSs, but if not, it'll prompt you to install them. So again, this is the older 1362 version, and we were looking at, I think, 2.1 uh, on the other one. So this is basically the one that will install and run on 32 bits. Um, essentially the same. You know, if you look at the log files, um, you don't have quite as many, but you still have pretty decent choices. Um, but again, I, I don't think there's any real reason, right? This is all upwardly compatible. So as long as you've got a 64-bit machine somewhere, just get the 64-bit one and deal with that. Even if you want to monitor a 32-bit box, it's completely backwards compatible in terms of producing those files as an HTM format that you can suck into Perfmon and run. So that said, let's take a look at one. We'll save those for a little bit later. Where did I stick it? I've lost it now. Ah, there we go. So this is what your output file looks like. This is actually slightly um, uglier than you might see. I have broken some of the hyperlinks in this by moving it around so many times that some of the paths to the graphics have been lost, but I think it'll certainly give you an idea of what you're looking at. Uh, by the way, I should ask, anybody got any questions at this point? Yes? Uh, automate in what sense? Right, that's what PAL will do for you. When you execute the option, when you point it at that log file and choose a threshold and you click execute, it will go ahead and this is the report that it produces. This is the automated report that comes out at the end. The data collection, no, you can automate the creation of the files that have to be pulled into either data collector set in 2008 or Perfmon itself, but you're still gonna have to manually pull that in and start the log file. There is no way to actually tell it to start the log file. PerfWiz kind of does that, but again, only on the older operating systems can you use that start and stop. Yes? If you cared to learn how to compare this to an OS environment, what would you see the troubleshoot as uh, your correct problem? How, okay, so we're talking, if I personally had an issue that was urgent in my environment, in my environment, with my experience with Edge Site, I'd probably honestly be here first. Um, my edge site environment is not where I want it to be. Part of that might be my fault. Part of that I've become convinced is just a fault of the product. I don't think edge site is very good at real-time analysis. You do have that real-time analysis function in there, uh, but it seems very costly and very slow to me. Um, so I'm not that much of a fan of it. I, I spent like a year and a half figuring out that I just didn't know how to make edge site work, and I've come to the conclusion I may not know how to make it work, but I don't think anyone else really makes, knows how to make it work for real-time monitoring and problem discovery. I mean, it's supposed to, but I just haven't run into many people who've been able to do it. And if you have, by all means, come by later. I'd be happy to buy you more beer than you can drink to hear your stories. Um, because if I could make that thing work, it would take a lot of, take a lot of gray hair or lack of hair <laughs> away. Anyone else? Okay, so let's take a quick look at the report. So what this does here um, is it just summarizes by the different types of Perfmon counters. So at the processor level, it tells you how many alerts did I have and for which uh, types of, uh, of counters. So you can scroll through this stuff. You have some summary here on the tool parameters. Uh, it does some checking stuff. This is the interesting part down here. It starts getting in and telling you what, is your, what are your issues in this particular time. 
You're very low in available memory, less than 5% available. Well, I could have figured out that one even without PAL, but you know, it's good to know that it caught it, right? So we've got processor utilization, and we've got average disk responsiveness is slow, more than 15 milliseconds. Well, that's pretty nice. That's actually telling me a number, right? At which point should I figure um, that I have an issue with disk? As we move down through this, because this is a, um, has got multiple slices in here, you can t we're going to see a lot of the same stuff over time, and this is what you'll see with the PAL report. If you're having a problem with memory or disk, it's probably going to be repeated in each one of these time slices that it looks at. Because those problems, if they went away, you wouldn't be having problems. They have to stay around for you to have problems to begin with. So you'll see a lot of repetitiveness here, and that should give you a cue, an idea that this is actually a problem, because you keep seeing the same problem popping up over and over again. And then here comes a lot of the value of PAL here, which is the actual parsing of the data. So here's your processor utilization analysis. It gives you some you know, summary of what the counter is. And here's one of the nice things here. I've broken this link, but we might see it in another one is, is not only does it tell you that this is what we think a number is a problem, I'm going to give you a link to an MSDN article to back it up. So when you get in those arguments with your coworkers or other people like that about whether or not this is a meaningful number, you can go, dude, don't argue with me. Go look at Microsoft. They're the ones who published this and told you this is a problem. Um, and I think that's very useful if you have to go to management, right? You know, because management's going to sit there and say, so you got numbers. I don't care. Okay, now I can show you something from Microsoft that's a best practice or a, rec or a recommended threshold that says we need to do something about this. Um, so this works all the way down. You have processor queue length again. Here, let's pop that right out, and hopefully I haven't dropped internet. We'll actually go take a look. Yeah, so we pop right out here to a measuring.net application performance article that's going to tell you where their thresholds came from and everything else. Um, that has won me more arguments than I care to count. You know, if it's a published article from Microsoft, you know, any cynicism of Microsoft aside, right, that carries a fair amount of weight if you're, you know, a Microsoft shop. So you get all kinds of interesting stuff, privilege mode CPU anal uh, analysis, like I would ever, you know, remember that for more than 30 minutes. And as you can see, I'm just going to scroll through this, and you can probably, well, I don't know if you can, see my scroll bar over there. You get a big report. You get a lot of data here. Um, you're not getting shortchanged because this is a free uh, tool. Here's your network utilization analysis. Again, another MSDN link. And when you get alerts on a particular counter, so at this point, we're back looking at physical disk read latency. So we're going to get this described. We're going to get a nice threshold. If you can't see that in the back, it says if response time is greater than 15 milliseconds, then the disk subsystem is keeping up with demand but doesn't have much overhead left, so essentially yellow. If response time is greater than 25 milliseconds, the noticeable slowdowns and performance issues may be affecting users. I like that. Here's a warning. Here's a red. Here it will give me information, the minimum, average, and max for the time slice that I'm looking at, the hourly trends, standard deviation. Yeah, OK, if I remember my college statistics, right? I'm more interested in percentiles, right? What's the 90th percentile, the 80th? That will give me some idea of, you know, am I just spiking or am I looking at more sustained higher numbers? And then here are the individual alerts, the time it happened, the average, the max, all that kind of stuff. To be honest, this is better than half the commercial tools I've looked at, I think. I mean, you guys tell me if you're out there in the market for this stuff, but, you know, this is a pretty impressive report, you know. The drawbacks to this are that it's not easy to point at an entire infrastructure and monitor at once. But for monitoring a particular issue, I mean, we're still going. This is what I mentioned earlier, by the way. If you're on a, a terminal server or some sort of multi-user box, monitoring every process can get, a, can get out of hand pretty quickly. You're going to have hundreds and not thousands of processes if you've scaled your servers right. Pool non-paged and pool paged bytes. Anybody ever bit hard on that 32-bit kernel limitations? Everybody had to troubleshoot that? Yeah, God, that's ugly, isn't it? Boy, that's the best thing about 64-bit is not having to worry about that stuff so much. There's your available memory. Memory pages per second. Now you're looking at paging stuff. Memory leak detection. Some of the stuff take a, um, with a little grain of salt. Um, a, quote, memory leak. Just because a, you know, a number is rising on a process doesn't necessarily mean it's a leak, particularly in this age of uh, managed and .NET code. Um, but it's certainly nice to have something that's flagged for you. And then if you want to dig deeper, well, you can go get the link to the debug diagnostic tool and pr 
and you know pr pursue that further. So we can scroll here for a long time, but just to give you an idea, this is a nice report. It's even suitable for management, right? Anybody have any questions at this point? Wow, this is going quicker than I thought. Yes? The actual monitoring doesn't because you're to, um, this question is, is, does this put much load on the box being monitored? Part of that's a function of how many counters you're doing in the frequency. Um, but Right, exactly. So generally speaking, um, that's one of these cases when you might want to trim some of this down. But if you're only sampling something at 15 or 30 seconds, um, it's not bad, and one of the unfortunate realities of troubleshooting is, is you might have to kick your box even harder to figure out what's wrong with it, and that's just the only way you're going to get data out of it. Now, baselining, a little bit different story, right? You want to be a little bit more careful with your frequency. Um, when I do a lot of my baselining, honestly, I've taken those XML templates and I hack the process stuff out. If I'm interested in monitoring processes, I do that at another way and another time, but I don't need to know what the memory footprint of you know, the 1,800 processes or something like that that's running on my Zen app boxes. Um, that's just not usually a concern of mine. Uh, the processing, again, though, the processing is extremely intensive. So wherever you have Palette self-installed, you want to make sure that there's nothing production on that box, because it'll take almost as much as you'll give it. So download it, install it if it's needed, run it a few times to get familiar with it, and archive your output. Look like a hero at work. Uh, so I want to talk just a little bit briefly about counters. Um, processor, memory, disk, network. Um, just a little bit briefly to make sure that we're kind of all the same page on that. Uh, processor counters, the one you always see is percent processor time. That's the amount of time that is spent executing things other than the idle thread. Um, the more human interaction the system has, the more significant that is. So if it's customer facing, if it's a Zen app box, or maybe something like Exchange that's delivering things to Outlook, um, I don't like to go above 70% on that. Um, one of the numbers I like better for detecting bottlenecks and problems, though, is the system processor queue length, because that intimates how much work is, is uh, waiting to be processed. So that's actually an indicator of backlog. Um, so you can be busy at a percentage level, but not be backlogged. In other words, you're, you're in yellow, but you're not in a crisis yet. Once you see that queue length climbing, you got trouble. And anytime you see the word queue, you got to think about a number to divide it by. It's a per CPU or per core. So you've got to divide that. If you have a quad core box, and you know a dual socket quad core, you need to divide that number by eight. And you really only want to get worried when it gets above two per CPU. So processor by process, um, you can take a look at any individual processes that are hogging the box. Um, obviously, sustain 100% is bad, but you know I've seen environments where that's what their apps do, right? They go to 100% for five, 10 minutes, I don't know, maybe they're doing floating point or you know, some sort of large data insertion in a SQL table. Know your environment, that's what they'll do. Know your apps, know if that's how they behave, right? That's the goal of all of this baselining stuff, to get a handle on what your apps do. Memory pages per second, it's the total number of paging operations, reads and writes. This is one that I always find misinterpreted. Um, there, are page, there are pages and there are pages, and we really only care about one kind of paging. Hard page faults, right? A soft page fault is essentially a memory keeping operation. It has to do with moving things out of a process working set into things like the free and standby lists. Mark Rasinovich goes through this in great detail in Windows internals. If you have a need to know this, um, certainly uh, get that book and read it from him. But you only care about hard page faults. And those counters in Perfmon are not exactly always clear what they're measuring. Always hit that box that says show description and make sure that it's talking hard page faults. I would suggest to you that only hard page faults that are writes to the disk are really that much of a problem. I don't even think reads back in are much of a problem. Um, so not all paging operations are equal. Uh, make sure what you're looking at is really the problem. And again, you're looking at trends. So memory available bytes includes that free standby and zero lists. Um, opinions vary there. Um, if you're below 10% on a regular basis, I think that's an issue. And I even think that's an issue when you get to these larger footprint boxes, when you get up to 24, 32 gigs or something like that. I like to load RAM in. Um, I like to use caching. Um, so I want lots of available memory on my boxes to be able to cache things in memory. It's the great thing about 64-bit windows, right? We no longer have that page pool limitation 
on the uh, cache in Windows so that you can start mapping a lot of things into that virtual address space and not worry about a kernel memory shortage. Um, and available memory always helps these cascading failures of other systems, right? You know, if you're not watching carefully, you look at a box and it appears like you have a disk problem. Well, you've only got a disk problem because you're paging. You're only paging because you don't have enough memory. Four gigs of RAM or buying a whole new I.O. subsystem or, you know, look at putting it on a SAN or something like that. It's a no-brainer on where the, uh, what's the best bang for your buck. Um, working set, that's just the individual amount for the apps. Again, that's something you want to watch. You know, in my particular case, I get new tax applications every year, and I'm always interested in profiling these because they always have different memory footprints, and because they're updated frequently throughout the year, I get changing requirements. Um, in my industry, nobody really gets a tax application the first version out before November. And if you've never dealt with this industry, it's nuts. Um, updates come virtually every day. When you're in a place like the U.S. where we've got state, federal, local, sometimes county taxes, um, forms constantly updated, calculations updated, deductions changing, exemptions changing, you know, this standard thing, this, that. You know, so we literally run updates probably at least 200 days of the year. And from December to April 15th, every single business day, which is six days a week essentially because we do them on Sunday to prepare for Monday, we're running updates. Which, by the way, makes our QA really interesting. You know what our QA is? Yep, it opened. <laughs> and again, um, you know, my interest in some of these tools was figuring out what was going on with the apps because we saw great changes in behavior through variations. And our programmers are very open about it. You can't write apps containing millions of lines of code every year and not have mistakes in them or things that are less optimized than, you know, other things, right? Um, and so they're actually really interested to know what kind of information we can supply them because many times they don't know, nor do they have the time or inclination really to focus on that stuff. So if you can tell them, hey, it's really interesting. You guys are pulling, you know, 100 megs more for the same opening screen this year than you were last year. And they go, oh, really? Well, we have an update three days later. <laughs> That's nice. Thank you. Um, and by the way, um, if you have more managed code and .NET code in your environment, um, these things change a lot. .NET code is far more aggressive at holding on to memory than the old native code ever was. And this has kind of changed the game for us because, you know, you're, you read about managed code and .NET stuff, right? And I've got these garbage collection routines and I've got compaction and address spaces, all the stuff that really sounds great until you get down to the details where it says the .NET memory manager will compact this and will free it up, but it isn't given it back to the OS until it asks for it because that is a performance optimization. And there are some variations on this stuff depending on the version of the .NET framework you're on and how it handles this. But generally speaking, managed code will hang on to memory far more aggressively than your old Visual C++ native code. Um, and so it puts you in an interesting you know, position, right? You're watching all these processes with really high memory numbers. Do I have a problem? Do I not have a problem? You know, what happens here? Okay, if I trigger a working set trim by really getting low on memory, the numbers drop dramatically. Well, that's good. In a way, I got my memory back. It's also bad in a way that I just had a whole lot of memory that got freed by all these .NET apps at once. And that's a lot of housekeeping. Um, you know, regardless of whether or not I'm actually going to disk or paging, it's still a lot of housekeeping. Um, and it certainly makes your numbers look really, really funny, right? You get really, really nervous because all of a sudden all your boxes are sitting up here at the top of their memory limits. And then psh. Um, so anytime you get apps that are using more .NET framework, more managed code than you're used to, Take a long, careful look at them. I think you can be surprised at, at what you might see. Wow, I am really running out of time. Um, so I guess I'll skip the other log file I was going to show you, which was absolutely drenched in blood. Um, if you have any interest, look me up. I can uh, show you what happens when a Zen app server all of a sudden is disk bottlenecked, and it's not pretty, uh, either <laughs> from your customer standpoint or from the graph standpoint. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Yes, absolutely. I use this information to plan my capacity because I look at where I am. Um, and what tends to happen, right, is you move various bottlenecks around on the server, right? Um, you know, generally speaking, and I'm talking starting back like eight years ago or something like this, we were always memory bottlenecked, right? It was a 32-bit world. We had kernel space issues, all of that fun stuff. You know, we were playing around games. And, you know, as service packs and different releases came from Microsoft, they moved more and more stuff out of kernel space. So we were able to move and use the PAE switch and get up to 8 gigs on a 32 box. And you know, depending on your apps and everything else, we went through this whole song and dance and everything. And then we walked into a 64-bit world, and we went, yes, buy me RAM. Buy me by the handful. 
you know, so we added a lot of RAM on the boxes, and then what started to happen? We started to disk bottleneck, and that puzzled us a little bit at first because we thought we had plenty of memory, but then what we realized is, is we've got a lot of users on these boxes now because we have a lot of RAM, right? But our apps write a lot into temp on the individual user profile, so we're starting to generate disk activity that we can't fix from a RAM standpoint. So now we need to start looking back at the disk subsystem. So you know, you started looking. Well, I got a 256 you know megabyte caching controller. Now the boxes I buy have a gig caching controller, and I'd buy bigger, but I don't think they sell it, right? You know, if you've been doing this for a few years, isn't that mind-boggling? A one gig hard drive, <laughs> you know, <laughs> caching drive controller. Wow. Uh, but yeah. So this helps us identify those sorts of things. We were looking at the disk responsiveness you know, through reports like this going, we've got tons of free memory. You know, there's six, seven gigs free, but our disks are really starting to suck wind on this. And so now we need to look at that and see what we can do to address that. Yeah? All my stuff is on bare metal. Um, that's a whole other discussion, which would be interesting to have because I don't trust most virtualization guys with Zen app workloads. It can be done. Certainly go listen to the project virtual reality check stuff. Your own and the login VSI guys and all those guys have done great work on hypervisors. But anytime a virtualization guy comes in and he says we're going to oversubscribe CPU and memory, get the hell out of my, don't even come near me. You're not doing that to my Zen app workloads. You want to virtualize, fine. We're not oversubscribing. I've seen too many things go up in flames. I'm not saying you might not be able to get away with it in the right situation with the right apps and the right everything else, but it's damn hard in my opinion. Either that or I don't have good virtualization guys, or both. Anyone else? All right, thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate it. I know it's a big pain in the butt. Please do the feedback on those forms. After you've done two of them, nobody wants to do a third, but this is only as valuable as the feedback we get from you guys so we know what to do and what to talk about. I don't get to talk in front of people for a living much. I work for a living, um, so I'm not as smooth as a lot of these consultant guys you'll see here. So anything you can tell me, constructive, deconstructive, or otherwise, I really appreciate. Thank you. <laughs>